Thursday, almost through the week. It's Bishop on Air. Thanks for hanging out with me each and every weekday morning. Around this time, 735, 740, 745, who knows. Uh, but do appreciate you guys checking in. Like, subscribe, hit that notification bell. I think last I checked, I'm about 35 subscribers away from 14,000 subscribers on YouTube. But you can follow me on X, on Facebook, and just search Bishop on Air, and uh, you'll be able to find it. Good morning to all checking in in the uh, live stream this morning. Appreciate you guys being here. Good morning, RB. Tiberius struggling with the Mathies. Is that his? uh, Mathises? Uh, Dave, Randall, Bat, Ozzy, Chad. Uh, Good morning, everybody. All right. Uh, Hopefully you guys uh, enjoyed yesterday's presentation of the uh, one-year anniversary of the state's gun and magazine ban and how we got to this point. Uh... Daniel says I should have 2.4 million subscribers. That's <laughs> that's pretty good. Um, but yeah, hopefully you guys enjoyed looking at the past year and the trajectory of where we're at right now. Uh, there's tons going on, of course, when it comes to the conversations about the gun and magazine ban. The total number of people registered uh, will actually hear from Governor J.B. Pritzker, who held his first news conference yesterday up in Chicago of the year. Uh, in that first news conference of the year, focusing on the state's economy. But he was asked uh, a myriad of questions, including to react to what uh, some are seeing as extremely low compliance rates for the gun and magazine ban. So we'll hear about that. Uh, Also, we'll uh, tackle some of the latest back and forth about migrants in Illinois with um, some comments from the governor. But also, I talked with U.S. Congressman Darren LaHood, Peoria Republican, and uh, the McLean County emergency management agency director uh, who shared an email uh, that uh, we'll uh, review as well. So stay tuned. That's coming up here with Bishop on air. Uh, Like, subscribe, follow along, uh, especially all throughout the day. If you follow me on X, you can uh, follow the work I do with the center square.com and Illinois radio network, putting out reports across the state. So you can follow that. Uh, So I appreciate you guys being here. All right. uh, Stay tuned. Much more coming up with Bishop on air. people who missed the deadline who will have the opportunity and still do isp has said that 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 registration is open to people even now um, we have rules in place there'll be rules that'll be codified i suppose uh once the once jcar gets together uh over the next month well a couple weeks and, and month after that as well and we'll work through the le- registration challenges over the next month or two. it's governor jb pritzker yesterday at his first news conference of the new year and his first news conference after that January 1st deadline of the gun ban registration in the state of Illinois. Welcome back. It is Bishop on Air here with you each and every weekday morning where we uh, take a look at uh, a lot of focus on the litigation against the state's gun and magazine ban. I know a lot of you are coming to this channel for that. Um, We do have tomorrow a scheduling conference in the Southern District of Illinois Federal Court with Judge Stephen McGlynn uh, asking litigants in that case 
what kind of witnesses, what kind of expert testimony they expect during evidentiary hearings. Uh, so they're going to start getting to the merits of the issue. Here we are now, a day and a year after the law was enacted. Uh, it really kind of shows how quick uh, you can enact a law, but then challenging the constitutionality of that it takes a long time, and I know a lot of people were anticipating uh, action from the U.S. Supreme Court to have an emergency injunction. Requests to do that were denied on several fronts, uh, and those were just preliminary requests, things not focused on the merits of the issue. Uh, those things still have to be dealt with, uh, but by having to request preliminary injunctions to try to block the law from being implemented, that has taken a lot of the court's attention in the various jurisdictions, going all the way up to the Seventh Circuit U.S. Court of Appeals on a preliminary basis, and then up to the U.S. Supreme Court on a preliminary basis. But now that those preliminary measures have ultimately been exhausted, uh, you've got uh, some looking to go back to the U.S. Supreme Court to ask about the merits, but others back in the district court trying to deal with the merits, and that's what's going to happen in the Southern District of Illinois with Judge Stephen McGlynn and the Barnett case, which is kind of the case that lumps all of these uh, challenges in the Southern District together. So we'll be watching that, and uh, we'll be reporting out what happens with that scheduling conference on Friday. Uh, but of course, January 1st was the deadline to register certain semi-automatic firearms. Uh, for the total number of FOID card holders, 2.4 million individuals who have a a firearm owner identification card with the state of Illinois. The state of Illinois is one of, I think, four states that require that type of pre-purchasing license to be able to exercise your Second Amendment right to keep and bear arms. Uh, so while that's being challenged, and that's something else we'll have to follow as well, because uh, we do have some uh, things coming up later on this year in federal challenges against the firearm owner identification card. But that's separate and aside. 2.4 million FOID card holders in the state of Illinois. Of that, Around 30,000 have said that they own a banned item, which comes out to about 1.2% of total FOID card holders registering banned items. So that's one percentage, because the only the benchmark, the only benchmark we have in Illinois is that FOID card number, right? That's the number of firearm owner identification card holders. Not every FOID card holder has a firearm. Um, but some FOID card holders have multiple firearms. Um, and that's what we've seen in some of the data, at least. But the estimates are anywhere between 1.2% compliance rate to maybe 4 or 8% compliance rate when you extrapolate some other studies saying, you know, there's 20% of gun owners have certain types of uh, AR-15s or something to that effect. But the real issue is it, we don't know the total number of individuals who have complied with this. However, all indication is that it's below 10% compliance, meaning 90% of individuals who uh, would fall under this act in Illinois have not complied. So uh, Governor J.B. Pritzker in his first news conference of the year after the January 1st deadline, uh, he talked about the economy with a lot of the other individuals in the business community up in Chicago and touting new numbers. Uh, but during Q&A, uh, a lot of op off topic. They focused on migration, which we'll touch on in another segment. But uh, he was also asked about the firearms and uh, how many people have uh, not registered and how it's going to be enforced and uh, still some looming questions about all of the uh, firearm registration rules that there are. Here's the governor. Uh, let's see. There's a lot in that question. Let me start with uh, uh, calling out the misinformation coming from the other side. Uh, 2.4 million FOID card holders does not define the denominator. Not everybody has a, uh, an assault weapon. And as you saw from the folks who have registered, many people have multiple assault weapons of their own. So each FOID card holder that has registered has had multiple. So uh, uh, my point is that many people already have registered, and we don't know the number of people that have those assault weapons in hand. What we know is that it's going to be vastly fewer than 2.4 million uh, FOID card holders, and I think you've acknowledged and, and, and said that uh, yourself. Uh, and so uh, we certainly are trying to make it you know, as easy as possible for people to do that. Uh, there are people who missed the deadline who will have the opportunity and still do. ISP has said that, that that registration is open to people even now. Um, we have rules in place. There will be rules that will be codified, I suppose, uh, once, the, once JCAR gets together uh, over the next month, well, a couple weeks and, and month after that as well. 
Um, and uh, so, uh, but, but I also want to make something very clear. Don't fall for the, you know, uh, the shiny object that they're trying to get you to pay attention to about registrations. It is illegal and impossible to purchase an assault weapon at a store in the state of Illinois today because of the legislation that we passed. High capacity magazines are unavailable. Assault weapons are unavailable to be purchased in the state of Illinois as a result of the legislation that we passed. And we'll work through the registration challenges over the next month or two. So again, uh, Governor J.B. Pritzker yesterday uh, in a news conference that he um, had uh, about the economy, but he was asked about the firearms registration numbers and the uh, appearance of a really low compliance rate. Uh, So he also mentioned JCAR. Right. And uh, the the Joint Committee on Administrative Rules, uh, where uh, you've got the second notice filings still have yet to be dealt with. Uh, And that's going to come up next week on Tuesday. The Joint Committee on Administrative Rules will be meeting and taking up those rules. Uh, What happens? Could they possibly suspend the rules because of the continued confusion? Could they object to the rules uh, having, uh, you know, some some filings that uh, they want uh, serious answers to? Are they going to accept those rules on uh, second notice? Because as of right now, you've got a whole bunch of, uh, you know, unanswered questions and holes in the rules that people are bringing up from, you know, the types of firearms to, you know, what constitutes a licensed shooting range to how airsoft components are going to be treated by all of this uh, so the list of, of questions continues to to grow uh, as to exactly how this is uh, going to be implemented moving forward even after the um, January 1st uh, deadline to register uh, so uh, again this week Friday scheduling conference and litigation against the gun ban going on the merits down in the Southern District we'll be watching that next week Tuesday the Joint Committee on Administrative Rules meets where they are expected to take up the second notice gun ban registry rules uh, and we'll also just get more reaction uh, all together from uh, the the various uh, individuals who are behind this but also those who continue to oppose it so uh, this is some of the latest here on this Thursday with Bishop on air uh, follow along on X, on Facebook, on YouTube. Hit that like and subscribe notification bell, and uh, we can connect that way, all right? It is Bishop on Air each and every weekday morning. Thank you for being here. Uh, We've got more coming up, uh, so stay tuned. Republican Congress passed last summer, it would have a significant effect on the border uh, and fixing the problems there. It would do many of the things that need to be done. But of course, my Democrat colleagues did not support that. The Biden administration doesn't support that. They want more of the same. It's uh, Congressman Darren LaHood, Republican from Peoria, yesterday had a conversation with him about the ongoing situation at the southern border uh, and how it's impacting Illinois. Yeah, we're thousands of miles away from the southern U.S. border, but uh, Illinois getting nearly 30,000 non-citizen migrants. The governor says that they're all asylum seekers, but apparently in the Biden administration, you can cross the border and uh, declare asylum and then uh, be given, what, like a seven to ten year stretch before you actually go to an asylum hearing uh, so clearly there's some uh, some big things that uh, are of major concern and uh, we continue to see the influx of migrants but also a patchwork of sorts of different municipalities across the states taking actions to uh, work at curbing the uh, influx of migrants or the overflow of migrants coming to their communities uh, and if you uh, look at the work I do with the centersquare.com uh, you can see the headline 
headline, Illinois limited in regulating migrant buses as blame for the crisis continues. Uh, and this, of course, is at thecentersquare.com. So, uh, Governor J.B. Pritzker yesterday uh, in an unrelated news conference uh, during the Q&A, he was asked a, a whole series of questions and a lot of them uh, focused around migrants and how the state is uh, working uh, to address the situation. Uh, and uh, we'll also hear from a McLean County Emergency Management Director uh, and also more from Congressman Darren LaHood about all of this. But here's what the governor had to say. Well, let's remind everybody that it is the choice, the inhumane choice of the governor of Texas and his colleagues in Texas to send thousands of people across the nation and specifically to Chicago, uh, many of them with sandals on their feet, with no coat when they arrive, uh, who haven't been given a meal in quite some time, uh, and they arrive here in need. Now, nobody thinks this is a good idea, especially in December, January, and February in Chicago, uh, to take them out of an environment in which um, the weather is much warmer and put them in a freezing cold uh, environment, especially as we saw the weather yesterday. Uh, so let's just all recognize that this is being foisted upon the city of Chicago. Nobody's asked for this. This is something that the governor of Texas is doing to other cities across the nation. So the governor uh, then went on to talk about how the state's stepping up to provide resources to uh, communities that might get some of this overflow, because while the governor says that this crisis is being foisted on cities like Chicago, you also got to look at what's being foisted onto the areas down at the border, uh, the El Paso, uh, the, 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 uh, El Paso uh, Pass. You've got the the the, uh, the what's the other one I'm thinking of? Why am I just on a complete blank on that? Maybe some of the chat can help me out. <laughs> Eagle Pass. Thank you. Uh, I came eventually, right? Uh, but the Eagle Pass uh, you know, areas, uh, those communities are small. You know, maybe 10, 20, 30,000 sized towns, and then they're getting inundated with upwards to 8 million people over the past three years. Uh, so, you know, where's the foisting really happening? And where are the uh, major resources needed in all of this? While Chicago and other cities are uh, looking at uh, asking the federal government for more money, uh, you've got uh, local cities looking to block migrants from coming to their towns. Chicago, uh, they implemented uh, some bus regulations saying that if a bus drops migrants off uh, at an undisclosed location, they could possibly have their bus impounded and the bus company could be fined. Well, that action led to the bus companies then dropping off migrants in some of the suburban areas. And that has now led to areas across the state looking at passing resolutions saying that they're not going to accept such migrants. Now, I was provided uh, an email at, through a Freedom of Information Act request from the McLean County uh, Emergency Management Agency director here in Illinois. Uh, and after I got it confirmed via a FOIA request, uh, I do want to take a look at this because this is some of the things that you got to consider on a county county level what's happening uh, in McLean County the emergency management director Kathy Beck she said in a uh, January 2nd email that they're working to make plans for if they were to receive a bus of migrants. Uh, she goes on to say that they've had no notice or have not uh, been given any indication of how many people, if any, would choose to stay here instead of going to an intake center. And uh, apparently there's some documents attached to this email that I was not provided. Uh, there's uh, it must be planning documents or something. But uh, she goes on to say the biggest one is identifying a place that could be used as a shelter if there are a handful of individuals that would choose to stay. There could be minimum requirements for such facilities, like having adequate sleeping area, restrooms, showers, and cooking space with at least a microwave. Each community must have additional code requirements. Uh, and then uh, also reaching out, uh, this is an email to local officials uh, about uh, you know, looking for these places. You may need to ask your mayor or chairperson. We'd work with community agencies to provide supplies, including food, cots, and bedding, as well as social services. And then she says, I believe this will be a hot topic. So the request is you treat this as for your information only and not to share it with those who don't need to know. Uh, but ultimately, Kathy Beck is, uh, you know, saying that uh, they're looking for some areas in McLean County and some rural areas that uh, might be able to take in migrants if those migrants being dropped off by a bus 
choose to stay in that area instead of going to a processing facility in Chicago. Well, I connected with uh, uh, Beck yesterday briefly uh, and asked her about this uh, this this email and uh, what the plans are moving forward. And here's uh, some of what she had to say. Um, that's correct. Um, everybody everybody's looking at it. Um, what emergency management does is make plans. So we're following state guidelines. And if we are to get a bus, um, the best solution to get people the most help that they need is to direct that bus or those people up to the intake center in Chicago. And uh, she also said that they have not received any migrants at this point. But there's really not a whole lot of warning, um, if anybody, if, if any warning, on whether a bus is, is going to come at some point or where or how or whether it's a bus or a train or a plane. But ultimately, uh, it's about planning, she says. And uh, you've got the uh, emergency management director of McLean County uh, also addressing that uh, hot topic part of her email. Again, uh, she says in her email that uh, I believe this could be a hot topic, so request that you treat this as for your information only. Uh, and I asked her about that and uh, what uh, ultimately she's uh, you know uh, meaning by that statement. It's, it's catching a lot of people's attention, and people are... are making hard lines one way or the other on it and um, coming from the emergency management perspective our job is to help people the best we can i'm not picking any any side of the fence but mclean county is apparently uh poised to pass a resolution saying that they will not accept migrants or even tax dollars from the state uh, in order to care for those migrants, saying that they have limited resources themselves. But what about uh, all of these different, you know, bus ordinances that are going into effect? Chicago doing theirs, they're remaining a sanctuary city. You've got other areas saying that uh, they're going to regulate buses to a degree, uh, but they're not a sanctuary city or a sanctuary county. Uh, so you've got this kind of patchwork of bus regulations and different things, but uh, Governor J.B. Pritzker yesterday saying that the state really can't do much to bring about some kind of uniform regulations for buses. So as you know, the laws don't exist in the state of Illinois for us to do that today, right? We can't just impose some rules from the state level on every city, every county, every township. Um, there are certain towns and cities that have the ability to do that and certain that don't. Um, and so, you know, we've been listening to the various mayors and other leaders of those local uh, governments to find out what it is they'd like the state to do. And certainly this, as the legislature comes back into session uh, over the next week, um, they're going to be considering, you know, whatever the options are. But it's not just buses. Planes also involved. If you recall, there was a, a plane that landed at O'Hare, I believe another plane that landed at uh, Rockford, uh, and buses being sent to Chicago from those plane loads of non-citizen migrants. And the governor says they're doing what they can there as well. We haven't seen any in the last few days, have you? Um, and, uh, and let's just say everything that we can do, we intend to do and are in the midst of doing. Oh, there's a lot. I mean, I and and again, I don't want to give away our strategies. You know, we're we're trying to prevent those companies from uh, leasing their planes to the state of Texas. Uh, you know, you can't in general, you can't tell a group of people or an aircraft that it can't come somewhere. Uh, on the other hand, there are lots of things that I think would be a significant deterrent, and they already are working. So Governor J.B. Pritzker not willing to disclose the strategy in putting pressure on private airline companies that may charter flights from Texas to places like Chicago. But he says that whatever pressure they're having is uh, working. So interesting to, to see that. Uh, he also uh, you know, was just asked about the politics of all of this and uh, pointing fingers back and forth with the blame. Uh, and again, you heard that earlier. He said it's all because of the Texas governor and, you know, uh, foisting this situation on cities like Chicago. And that seems to neglect the idea that the Biden administration is foisting the issue on uh, Eagle Pass and El Paso uh, in those areas across the southern border. Uh, but, you know. I guess uh, we can do a flow chart to, to really see how that's all coming through and who's responsible for that. But the, the governor, you know, getting into the, the political conversations about all of this. Uh, and again, this is a cheap political stunt perpetuated by a governor, perpetrated rather by a governor in Texas who is simply trying to score points uh, for himself and his party. And one other thing, it's his party in Congress 
that is unwilling to come to the table to actually reach a, an agreement on comprehensive immigration reform and border security. And uh, the president is at the table and Democrats are at the table. It's the Republicans who seem to be walking away. I hope that they will not. There is a chance over the next week that his party, the the Republican governor of Texas party will do the right thing. But unfortunately, I'm pessimistic, haven't seen them do it as of yet and think that they think that this will be a good political maneuver in a presidential election year. It won't. People care about people and uh, the humanitarian crisis that the Texas governor and Republicans are causing uh, is one that we intend to address. And again, you know, I guess the way he's characterizing that, saying it's a humanitarian crisis created by the Republicans. Republicans will say the opposite, that it's the Biden administration's open border policies that are creating this humanitarian crisis. We'll actually hear from Congressman Darren LaHood in just a moment, but one last word here from the governor. Uh, we haven't seen those dollars yet, um, not nearly what we should. Uh, the federal government needs to do much more. I've said that publicly. I've put a letter you know, out there with specific ideas uh, that I think they should undertake. Um, some of those they've done, others they have not. And again, I'm on the phone very regularly, and my administration is with the White House to try to encourage. But remember, Congress has to act. And we have at least one House of Congress that isn't under Democrats' control. And they seem to be absolutely opposed to making progress on this issue. So I'm concerned. But what is that progress? Is that progress just more money? Is that progress more uh, work permits? Is that progress you know, uh, speeding up uh, the, the asylum hearings? Or is that progress uh, maybe more related to closing the border? Uh, I talked with Congressman Darren LaHood uh, and asked him to react to uh, Governor J.B. Pritzker, who said that it's Republicans in the U.S. House who don't want to, quote, make progress on this issue. Here's uh, Darren LaHood. Well, first of all, I would just say that's that's a complete lie, what he said. Uh, you know, there's been an abject uh, failure on behalf of the Biden administration when it comes to our southern border, uh, really uh, being overrun with illegal immigrants uh, and creating a humanitarian crisis, not necessarily uh, not on the border alone, but in cities like Chicago and New York and all across the country. It is, and, and this has in turn created a real security crisis for our country. It's an unmitigated disaster. So uh, I asked him what the first steps should be. Uh, should there be, you know, co compromise on immigration reform to get to closing the border, or should the border be closed first and foremost? Well, well, first of all, uh, w let's remember over the last three years, there's been eight million, eight million illegal crossings nationwide. Um, and, and so uh, the, the chaos that's been unleashed by these Biden policies of not enforcing the rule of law. So I would say, number one, you have to enforce the rule of law. We are a country based on the premise that laws matter uh, in a democratic system and a constitutional system like ours. Those are not currently being enforced. What has happened is you look at the fentanyl crisis that's been created, rising crime, um, the strain on our schools and, and community services across the nation. It's absolutely ridiculous. So what should happen, Greg, is go back to the policies we had under the Trump administration. What did they do? Uh, first of all, I'm not talking about building the wall. I'm talking about work with the Mexican government and say, we're not going to give you any more foreign aid or we're not going to give you any more support unless you stop everybody on the Mexican side. If you want to apply for asylum, if you want to apply to become a citizen, if you want to get a green card, if you have some reason um, that you want, do that on the Mexican side. That happened. We had the lowest illegal uh, crossings in the history of the country when that was put in place. That can be not done now. You could enforce the rule of law right now and stop people from coming across. That's not being done. And again, it's an unmitigated disaster that's having grave consequences for the country. And this isn't just from Republicans. This is Democrats. It's independents. It's libertarians all across this country. And uh, the congressman also talked about how Republicans have moved forward with some legislation in the U.S. House. I think he referenced uh, House Resolution 2 uh, that he said Republicans supported. I supported and we passed. The Republican Congress passed last summer. It would have a significant effect on the border uh, and fixing the problems there. It would do many of the things that need to be done. But of course, my Democrat colleagues did not support that. The Biden administration doesn't support that. They want more of the same. 
So here we are uh, having to deal with the ramifications of all of this. And I think that uh, we're going to hear a lot more heading into the rest of this year uh, as the uh, political ramifications, the consequences, uh, will they uh, lead to one outcome in November or the other outcome in November? And how is this in Chicago going to impact the Democratic National Convention, which is in August? And that's where they're going to select who is the Democrat nominee for president. Um, you got the Republican uh, conference in July, I believe. So uh, there's a lot of uh, politics that's going to be had uh, in the very near future. Uh, also, I think, uh, you know, you've got uh, just <laughs> the legislature coming back uh, with uh, with the idea of more taxpayer funds and uh, Governor J.B. Pritzker indicating that, indeed, he's in conversations with political leaders at the state house uh, and how they're going to possibly free up some more money to deal with all of this in Illinois. I'm Greg Bishop. Thanks for hanging out. Bishop on air. Like, subscribe, hit that notification bell each and every weekday morning. We go live uh, to break out everything you need to know here in Illinois when it comes to uh, a variety of issues from the Second Amendment to undocumented migrants to state house activity. Uh, so we'll be uh, tracking all of that. Hopefully you can uh, follow along and uh, enjoy some coffee with me each and every morning. All right. Uh, appreciate you guys tuning in. All right, that's all I got um, today. Don't forget, go over to thecentersquare.com where you can uh, see reports about what's going on in Illinois. Uh, you can get uh, quick overviews of some of the, the hot stories, uh, including uh, check out the story about what they're wanting to do with mail-in voting. Uh, and you can uh, see that from my colleague Kevin Bessler putting that story together and how there's a, a measure that looks to expand mail-in voting even more in Illinois. You also have had the U Illinois Supreme Court pretty busy this week. One case uh, dealt with uh, how to define armed habitual criminal. Check that story out. Another case deals with Miranda rights and a child death case. You can read that story. And yet even another story about uh, whether the smell of cannabis in a vehicle can lead to a search. Uh, so uh, the Illinois Supreme Court has been busy, uh, but of course, you can check out all of the stories and more at thecentersquare.com. And it's not just Illinois. Uh, you can check out stories from all over the country. Uh, pretty incredible team there at thecentersquare.com. So make that happen. All right, guys, uh, appreciate you tuning in. Thank you so much for being here each and every weekday morning. Again, this is just me in my own home, hanging out with you, keeping my uh, talk show muscle flexed. So hopefully you're enjoying it because uh, I am enjoying not having to go into a terrestrial radio station and still getting a good amount of reach. So appreciate you guys being here. Uh, have yourselves a wonderful day. Like, subscribe, hit that notification bell. Smash that notification bell. Uh, and also uh, check out some of the merchandise below if you're on YouTube or go to bishoponair.com. If you haven't been to the website, check it out, bishoponair.com. Appreciate you guys. We'll be back at it tomorrow morning. Same bishop channel, same bishop time. We'll see you then.